And so please help yourself to a sandwich or two and some beverage and we'll be underway shortly. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Well, thank you very much, and welcome to the Union League Club of Chicago. My name is Dave Cohn. I'm the Executive Director of Public Affairs, and it is my, my privilege to welcome you to the club on behalf of the officers, directors, and our members. Uh, we are very proud of our relationship with Reform for Illinois, formerly known as the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform. We've had a close relationship with this organization ever since its formation by the late, great Senator Paul Simon and our former Lieutenant Governor Bob Kustra. And these two organizations, the Union League Club of Chicago and Reform for Illinois, uh, share a common mission, and that is an educated electorate keeping uh, watch of those elected to serve us at the local, state, and federal levels, uh, and just generally being involved in civic affairs and trying to do whatever we can to help educate our members and the general public about the issues of the day. Uh, I wanted to mention briefly that the Union League Club of Chicago has the distinction of being the only private club in the United States, the only one with an institutional commitment to civic affairs activity such as this. Uh, the reason the club is engaged in this work is uh, tied to our founding back in 1879. The club is a descendant of a movement known as the Union Leagues of America that arose here in Illinois, in Pekin, Illinois, in fact, in 1862 a volunteer movement of citizens dedicated to helping President Lincoln preserve the Union. That's where the Union and the Union League name comes from. Uh, so that is why we are engaged in this kind of work and we've been doing it for the last 139 years and it is in that context we are so proud to be partnering with Reform for Illinois to present today's important candidate forum and we thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be with us and to engage with us in this important act of civic democracy. Uh, so thank you and welcome, and now to get our program underway and to continue, it's my privilege to introduce the Executive Director of Reform for Illinois, Mary Miro. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon. <laughs> welcome to the Reform for Illinois Attorney General Candidate Forum. My name is Mary Miro, and I'm the Executive Director of Reform for Illinois. As of last week, the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform officially changed its name to Reform for Illinois. We are so excited to continue to do our, this important work to improve transparency, accountability, and integrity in Illinois government with our new name. I'd like to thank again Dave Cohn and the Union League Club of Chicago for hosting our event today. Thank you also to the following sponsors of today's forum, Rebecca Boyd, Loyola University Chicago, Janice Rogers, and Jonathan and Gail Tan. 
Our event today will be aired by CAN-TV on cable news channel 27 and also live streamed at cantv.org. We will have a Q&A segment of today's forum. We believe it's very important to hear from the audience today. Um, we'll be collecting cards in advance, so as the, as the discussion is underway, um, please pass your cards to the end of the aisle, and my lovely staff will be collecting those, and then we will bring them up on the stage for the Q&A segment. We'll also be um, collecting questions via Twitter, so if you'd like to tweet questions or have your friends tweet questions, um, you can submit questions that way as well. And for our hashtag, will be it's ILGA Town Hall. If you'd like to sign your name or your organization's name on the card, you may. Um, we encourage that. If you'd like to have your questions anonymous, that is fine as well. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the stage the Democratic nominee for Attorney General Kwame Raoul and the Republican nominee. and the Republican nominee for Attorney General, Erica Harold. And Amanda Vinicky, who will be our moderator. Amanda is the political correspondent for Chicago Tonight, WTTW. Thank you, Amanda. Arms with Union League Club coffee, ha <laughs> ha. Good afternoon to everyone and Mary to you as well. Thank you very much for the invitation to moderate what is, is this the first forum under the newly christened Reform for Illinois? Second, oh man. First is worse, second is the best, okay. Um, anyway, I, with a high dollar and high stakes governor's race on the horizon, not to mention, of course, that little race for Chicago mayor, which seems like there may actually be more candidates than there were in the Democratic primary for the Attorney General's nomination. <laughs> it can be tough to get attention on some of these down-ballot races. So I do think that it is very important that we have a forum here today to hopefully bring in some public discussion and discourse to the state's chief legal officer. And with that, we would just like to begin with a brief introduction to so allow each of you to say who you are and then how you view the role of Illinois Attorney General. And because I'm a believer in going, sorry, Erica, reverse alphabetical with Vinicky, I was always last. <laughs> We're going to start with State Senator Kwame Raoul. Thank you, Amanda, and I want to thank uh, Reform for Illinois for hosting this forum. Um, uh, my name is Kwame Raoul. I'm a lifelong resident of the state of Illinois. I always like to uh, start out by introducing myself as a father of two children that I've raised in this state, two college-aged kids, because uh, my experience as a parent has, in, has impacted and informed my uh, role as a policymaker. I'm a lawyer of 25 years. I started my career as a prosecutor in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. I've worked in a community college system here in Chicago as an employment and labor lawyer. I've worked with two major law firms and in also a small uh, boutique practice. I've served uh, 14 years in the General Assembly. I've chaired the Judiciary Committee. My vision for the Attorney General's office is informed by... Oh, oh Lord. Well, this is exciting. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking for... I have a sparkly notebook with some questions that I misplaced. So I was looking in my backpack called the turtle and just, you know, really wanting to get things exciting. So there you go. You weren't trying to cut me you, off. Of no, 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 no. That was not one of those. On this particular occasion, that might come later. Well, with that, uh, uh, with the American flag, I think I want to talk about American history. Uh, I really think uh, that there hasn't been a time in American history where who we elect as Attorney General matters as much as it does today. I was recently at an ABA conference where Eric Holder, the former U.S. Attorney General, received an award, and our current Attorney General uh, introduced uh, Sherilyn Eiffel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And Sherilyn Eiffel said that it used, we used to count on the U.S. Attorney General to come into the states and protect the rights of the citizenry, oftentimes from the overreach of the state government or the local government, but now the shoe's on the other foot. 
uh, state attorneys general, both individually and collectively, have been fighting these fights on a broad range of issues, uh, protecting the environment, stopping the un-American act of separating children from their parents, uh, preserving the access to, to health care, uh, making sure that we don't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. On a broad range of issues, uh, state attorneys general are stepping up to the plate to protect the rights of ordinary citizens, and I will continue in that, in that role. Thank you very much, Senator. And now for Ms. Erica Harold. Thank you to everyone who took the time to come out today. This is a very exciting race because this is the first time in 16 years that it's an open race. And the stakes are very high in terms of what the Illinois Attorney General can do. So it's exciting that so many people took the time to be here. My name is Erica Harold. I'm an attorney from Champaign-Urbana where I was born and raised. I graduated from the University of Illinois and Harvard Law School, and my area of, of legal practice is complex commercial and civil litigation and constitutional law. I also am a commissioner on the Illinois Supreme Court Committee on Professionalism, and I serve on the Illinois Supreme Court Committee on Equality. Additionally, for the past 11 years, I've had the privilege of serving on the National Board of Directors of a group called Prison Fellowship, which is the nation's largest outreach to inmates and their families. In that capacity, we have worked to forge a bipartisan consensus on the need for criminal justice reform. I see the role of attorney generals being one to take the politics out of the office, to make sure that you are an advocate for all the interests of all Illinoisans, and to make sure that people are treated fairly and equally under the law. That decision to treat people fairly and equally under the law is one of the most imperative commitments that you have as attorney general. And it's so important to me because on a personal level, I've, I know what it's like to experience prejudice and discrimination. When I, when I was in high school, I was actually the victim of severe racial and sexual harassment, and I had to leave my high school as a result of it. That decision to have to leave the high school made me feel marginalized, but it was also what made me decide to become an attorney. I wanted to be an advocate not only for myself, but also for the rights of other people, and that's what I would do as your next attorney general. Thank you very much to each of you. Well, we do plan to focus this forum a lot on government and transparency issues. We do have some current events that I believe are important to address. So beginning with the emergence this week of information that Attorney General Lisa Madigan has opened a probe into Governor Bruce Rauner's administration in its handling of an outbreak of Legionnaires at the Veterans Home in Quincy. Do you believe this was an appropriate action for Madigan to take, and why or why not? And this time we can begin with you, Erica. Without knowing what laws that she's looking into and what evidence she has, it's not, I'm not able to, to comment whether it's appropriate for her to open that particular probe, but I am able to say definitively, it is very appropriate for us to have an investigation about what happened and what we can learn in terms of being able to prevent things from occurring in the future. And so I know with respect to the, to the Quincy home, there was an auditor general that was doing an investigation and I think that's very appropriate. The General Assembly was doing an investigation and that's also appropriate as well. Uh, and I think those things should continue to make sure that we have all the evidence we need and that we're able to institute best practices and reform practices if need be. But without knowing specifically what laws she's evaluating right now, I can't speak to her probe in particular. And how about you, Senator? I'm, I'm, I'm going to agree in part with uh, Erica on this. Uh, I cannot, I don't know exactly uh, what evidence of criminal activity there may have been. What we know is that some disturbing things happened at the Quincy Veterans Home that, caught, that led to deaths. And what we also know is that there was a cover-up of, of that. And that's, that's uh, very disturbing that that came from this administration. Uh, with all that said, uh, I have to agree with Erica that I am not privy to all of the information that would uh, uh, allow me to make a determination as I sit here as to whether a uh, criminal uh, probe or grand jury investigation uh, sh uh, should have been mandated. I will say I do trust Lita Ma Lisa Madigan's judgment. Um, I think she's exercised good judgment. Uh, on these powers over the course of the last 16 years. So I think more likely than not, um, um, she did the right thing, but I cannot say definitively. 
Moving on, there's also for the Democratic nominee for governor. This week, the Cook County Inspector General, a report um, came emerged that found that the Cook County Inspector General found J.B. Pritzker participated in a, quote, scheme to defraud local taxpayers by removing toilets from a home he was renovating in order to get a tax break and then submitting false affidavits. This apparently has been forwarded or is in the hands of the Cook County State's Attorney. Should Kim Fox not proceed with the criminal probe, should the Attorney General get involved as she has done with the Legionnaires case? And Mr. Raul, that begins with you. The same answer as before. I mean, I think the, it's, it's a question and it has to be an evaluation of where evidence leads. And, uh, you know, Based I on the evidence in the report that we have seen. Right. I, the, I you have not read the Cook County. I have, I have not read that that uh, report, and um, all I know is that there's been um, uh, excerpts of the report leaked out. I do know Patrick Blanchard. I did serve with him in the uh, Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Uh, I don't know what uh, the referral was, what the uh, recommendations uh, with the referral was, uh, but I do know that the Cook County State's Attorney's Office public and integrity unit is looking into it. I, again, I have faith in the public integrity unit of the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. So if they were to exercise a judgment that they shouldn't uh, go forward any further with a, with a criminal prosecution, uh, I would say, and this is all I can say, consistent with my previous answer, is more likely than not, uh, I would probably follow that lead. And do you have anything to add there, Ms. Harold? I think that it's appropriate to let the process play out, and based on what's in the report right now, it's not clear that there would be jurisdiction with the Illinois Attorney General's off office to handle what appears right now to at least be a private matter involving a citizen's tax issue. And so I think that it's appropriate for the state's attorney to take all appropriate action, which it appears that they are doing. And if additional evidence comes forth and there is jurisdiction within the attorney general's office to take further action, that would be appropriate. But I think in both of these cases, you have it's important to note why it's so important to keep politics out of this because you never want the legal process to be used as a way to punish political opponents, to score political, oppo political points. And you want when people conduct investigations, you don't want to question whether there are political implications. So at this point, I think it's appropriate to let the state's attorney's office conduct their investigation and then to reserve further comment if, you, if other evidence is, dis is disclosed. With each of these situations, there has been public feedback and reaction that appears as if there's political motivation, either in the leaking of the report or the investigation by the current attorney general. I would like each of you to address what you would do, particularly given that you have accepted campaign donations, for, in your case, from Governor Bruce Rauner and Mr. Arul, in your case, from the Blue Wave funded by J.B. Pritzker, how you would remove the appearance of political motivations in pursuing any potential investigations into whoever wins the governor's race and who that may be. So I believe this time, Erica, it is your turn to begin. I think preserving the independence of the Illinois Attorney General's office is very important. So one of the things I would do First and foremost is to seek outside ethics training to bring into the office upon taking office. The National Attorney General's Association, they work with various attorneys general throughout the state or throughout the country on certain conflicts of interest and issues that come up that are unique to the office of attorney general. So I would want those outside ethics trainers to come in to bring a fresh approach to how to properly identify those sorts of issues, and that would be an office-wide issue. Additionally, I would want to set forth a series of bright line rules about when it would be appropriate to take action. First, you look at the Illinois Constitution, and it gives the Attorney General certain power. Then there's the Illinois Attorney General Act. That gives certain power. And then the Attorney General's office is bound by the Code of Ethics that binds every, cert, every lawyer throughout the state. And so I would want to take my actions based on those particular rules and mandates and to make it clear that politics would not be a motivating factor. It would be the rule of law and the fidelity to the people of Illinois. And yes, please go ahead. I think first of all, uh, you know, at, at, 
how one staffs one, one's office is, is critical. And I think uh, Lisa Madigan has done a tremendous job staffing her uh, office with former uh, assistant U.S. attorneys and uh, other uh, prosecutors who are professionals, professional prosecutors. And to the extent, having served as a prosecutor, to, to the extent that you have individuals that have uh, had a background of following the law, not following politics, uh, you will have that consistency in the carrying out of the duties of the Attorney General's office. And then you have to have transparency. Thank you very much. Another corruption question, because that is one of the biggest problems in Illinois politics, or again, perceived as such, and that has contributed to a crisis in government. What specific and concrete problems can you address as Illinois Attorney General? And can you talk about what steps you would then take to address those issues? Well, with regards to the perception of per, uh, corruption is, is what you're... The perception question. or corruption when you do or see corruption. it happening. Well, <laughs> Reality, too. So, so I, think, uh, I think it was Justice Brandeis that, who said that the number one cleanser to public corruption is sunshine. Uh, that's why I worked with uh, the Campaign for Political Reform, now Reform for Illinois, and my former colleague, Su Susan Garrett, uh, and uh, Attorney General uh, Lisa Madigan in creating the public access counselor's uh, office in the Attorney General's office. Uh, I was a chief sponsor of that legislation. Uh, what has happened since is that incrementally the number of claims of uh, FOIA, bad FOIA denials or Open Meeting Act denials have increased year after year to where the public access counselor's office is way overburdened. So there's, uh, there's an obligation to shift resources or to invest resources in the public access counselor's office to, uh, ex uh, to be able to pr process these claims in an expeditious manner. Uh, I think there's also an obligation for the attorney general's office to be proactive and to work with uh, local, uh, uh, local governments as well as state uh, agencies such in a, such a manner where these claims are not referred to the Public Access Council's office and legitimate FOIA uh, requests and Open Meeting Act uh, uh, requests uh, are respected initially at the local government or the state agency level. Go ahead, Ms. Harold. I think the public access counselor part of the attorney general's office is one of the most powerful parts of the office because it is charged with enforcing compliance with the Freedom of Information Act and the Open Meetings Act. And one concrete thing that I'd like to see change is I'd like to see the public access counselor issue more binding opinions. Right now, the office issues a lot of opinions, most the overwhelming majority of which are advisory opinions. And one of the things that I think could help enforce compliance with these very powerful sunshine laws is if you're starting to create the body of law that weighs in on more of the novel situations because you're giving more guidance to the public bodies about the ways in which you need to see compliance. So I think having more binding opinions is something that would be very helpful. I also think the Attorney General's office needs more tools to be able to be more proactive as it relates to investigating incidents or allegations of public corruption. So I've called upon the General Assembly to provide the Attorney General's office with the ability to convene a statewide grand jury because that would enable the Attorney General to look more systemically and comprehensively at issues of public corruption. Senator Raul, do you believe that the Attorney General should have the power to convene a statewide grand jury? Uh, if I believe that the Attorney General's office is broader in nature in its, in its function, it's, it's much different than a U.S. Attorney's office or a local prosecutor's office, and that's uh, perhaps why that there hasn't been statewide grand jury power. If you do uh, embrace that, you got to embrace it with the resources to follow it as well. Um, what I do know, it's been said and it's been claimed that Lisa Madigan has not done um, the job of pursuing public corruption, I beg to differ with that conclusion. There are a long list of cases where she's prosecuted both Democrat and Republican public officials utilizing the existing uh, grand jury authority at the local level in cooperation with local state's attorneys. And I would seek, I've worked well with state's attorneys on a bipartisan basis uh, throughout my tenure in the uh, General Assembly. 
And so I would bring that experience to collaborating with state's attorneys as, a as the state's next attorney general. Do you agree with that sentiment that she has done an adequate or good job pursuing public corruption? Or can you name a case that you believe Lisa Madigan should have pursued and did not? I do not agree with the assessment that Lisa Madigan has done all she could to pursue public corruption. A specific instance when she had statutory authority to pursue public corruption was the 2014 patronage hiring scandal involving Governor Quinn's administration. There was an inspector general's report that was conducted and the report specifically said there was evidence of systemic pervasive misconduct. That's a trigger under the State Ethics Act that empowers the attorney general to conduct additional investigations and I believe that she should have used that authority to be much more proactive when I'm traveling around the state regardless of where I am in the state of Illinois and regardless of political affiliation people want someone who's willing to take on the issue of public corruption and to highlight it as something that's holding both parties accountable and if you know that this at attorney general is willing to use that bully pulpit to address it Hopefully, that will be an incentive for both parties to reform their ways. But on, on the larger issue of statewide grand juries, it's not just about empowering the attorney general to be able to be more proactive on the issue of public corruption. It's also about allowing the attorney general to is address issues of sex abuse as well. I'm sure many of you saw the Pennsylvania attorney general that disclosed a report that talked about some of the sex abuse that was occurring within that state and some of the archdiocese. I would wish to see our Attorney General be able to have the authority to conduct such an investigation so that it's not just about looking at what's happening systemically on a statewide level, but also to be able to set forth recommendations and best practices to move our state forward. I would say, Amanda, that the Attorney General is conducting that investigation. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll, we'll move on from there, but this is a healthy, hearty debate. Let's keep that up. Uh, you both mentioned the Public Access Counselor and the state's Freedom of Information Act. Can either of you name an exemption that is currently part of Illinois' FOIA law that you would like to get rid of? And anybody that has an answer, pop up, go for it. There's not an exemption that I would state right now because right now there's a backlog of cases within the Public Access Counselor's Office. And so before trying to expand the scope of the statute, I would want to make sure we could address the backlog that currently exists because continuing to expand without providing adequate resources and personnel, I don't think would serve the interests of what the act's supposed to accomplish. Senator Rowell? To save your time, no. Pardon? No. No, okay. <laughs> what about, I um, no, I believe I've actually asked you about this before, but mm -hmm. one that as a journalist often comes up is the exemption um, for the, the preliminary ex exemption, which means that the public and media, therefore, cannot access from elected officials, from state legislators, any sort of preliminary reports or correspondence. Why should that be a part of Illinois' FOIA law? Why should those correspondence not be open to the public as they are in other public entities? Well, it, it, it is um, the legislative process is a is a deliberative process and and what we do do not want to stunt is the uh, desire and um, the confidence of regular individuals to interact with their legislature and to allow the deliberative process to um, allow for legislation as you know from being down in Springfield uh, a bill that's originally in introduced not often ends up the same as it was introduced. The deliberative process, uh, the free deliberative process uh, along the way allows for amendments to come about, allows for that open interaction between ordinary citizens and their legislature. And um, we can, with, with removing such an exemption, we could stop that. And uh, Ms. Harold? I would be open to exploring it if the backlog could be reduced, but I don't think right now 
the office has sufficient resources to address um, expansions of it. Obviously, you'd want to be able to protect the privacy interests of citizens who are coming to meet with their members of the General Assembly. Um, I think right now expanding it to include preliminary deliberations might overtax the limited resource the Public Access Counselor has. And so at this point in time, I wouldn't advocate for expanding it. But that's not to say that if, if the backlog was to be reduced in the future, that I wouldn't be open to it. Let's move on to sexual harassment, something that in the era of hashtag Me Too has gotten a lot of attention. The Attorney General playing a significant role in that arena. What do you think about the way that sexual harassment complaints are currently handled in the Illinois General Assembly and Executive Branch? And what, if anything, would you change? Erica, this one goes to you first. I think the way that the current legislative inspector general process works is wholly inadequate. And I was very disappointed that the General Assembly did not act to reform that in its last legislative session. Right now, the Ethics Commission, which is comprised of legislators, would be the ones to sit as judge and jury of their colleagues. Right now, the legislative inspector general would not be fully empowered to conduct an independent investigation and would still have to seek permission from the Ethics Commission on being able to issue subpoenas to conduct a thorough and fair investigation. The specific reforms that I would like to see is a legislative inspector process amended to be more in line with what, how we investigate evidence or allegations of judicial misconduct, where the Illinois Courts Commission is the entity that's able to actually conduct an actual investigation. They're able to use evidence rules and they are able to actually make recommendations about punishment. There's also the transparency issue. Currently, if a legislator is found guilty or having actually engaged in misconduct or sexual harassment, that information may never be disclosed to the public. I believe the public would have the right to know because that kind of transparency and accountability is essential to good government. And yes, Kwame, please. Well, the, actually, the, uh, the legislature did act to reform the uh, process, and it was uh, actually women in the legislature that led, led the effort, and I applaud them, and I supported them in, in that process. And included in that reform was giving uh, the power to the legislative inspector uh, general to uh, operate uh, independently. Uh, there was a point where the legislation did not have that language in there, and uh, as I said before about how legislation develops during the process, uh, that was added on at the insistence of uh, my colleague, Senator uh, Melinda Bush. We can continue to do more. I think the Attorney General's office can be a place where, uh, an alternative place where people can feel safe uh, to, to report uh, uh, sexual harassment allegations. As we speak, a jury is deliberating on the future of Chicago police officer Jason Van Dyke accused of murdering teenager Laquan McDonald. Attorney General Lisa Madigan spearheaded, really, a consent decree oversight for the Chicago Police Department. Do you approve of that action, and what, if anything, is missing from the proposed consent decree or you believe should be taken out of it? And this one goes to you first, Senator. Uh, I absolutely approve that action. And this is an example of what I said at the outset in my opening remarks. Uh, state Attorney General stepping up where the U.S. Attorney General has stepped away. Uh, it was Loretta Lynch that initiated uh, this litigation. And when Donald Trump came into office and Jeff Sessions became our U.S. Attorney General, they stepped away from this and Lisa Madigan stepped up uh, where the void was. And so I applaud her for doing so. Uh, law enforcement reform is something I've long, long worked on. I passed a torture inquiry commission after revelations about John Burge uh, committing torture uh, that sent uh, men to death row for crimes they did not commit. I passed a comprehensive law enforcement re reform package before the revelations of uh, Laquan McDonald. Uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that I think that they're actually doing now is to, to try to have a little bit more public review and public input into the consent decree. There's another issue that uh, 
may not be a component of a consent decree, but touches this issue overall, not only for the Chicago Police Department, but for law enforcement generally. When we did our law enforcement reform uh, package, we created a commission on police professionalism to look into two things, the utilization of auxiliary badges and the potential for creating a licensing system for law enforcement officers. Right now, because of collective, collective bargaining agreements at the local level, it, it often is difficult to discipline uh, law enforcement officers when they've done something unprofessional, uh, unethical, or sometimes illegal. Uh, as a lawyer, if somebody complains to my employer, my employer may not want to take action, but the ARDC sure can. Uh, that exists for different professions. It should certainly exist for those who are authorized to carry deadly force. And Ms. Harold. I do support Lisa Madigan's decision to seek the consent decree because I think it offers a transformational opportunity for the city of Chicago to have benchmarks set in place for reform mechanisms. One of the things that makes this reform effort different, I think, from other times is there will be an independent monitor that is appointed by a federal judge, and that will make sure that we have the kind of concrete benchmarks that we need. I think they struck an appropriate balance in making sure that all the stakeholders had the opportunity opportunity to weigh in, that the community had the ability once the draft was released to be able to actually set forth additional public comments. Because one of the things that's most important about this consent decree is the opportunity to start to try to rebuild trust. One of the most effective ways that you can reduce violence is through community policing efforts. In addition to training and resources, it's that element of trust that helps to actually prevent crimes, helps to solve crimes, and helps to make people feel safer within their communities. And so I think the fact that I would want to commend Attorney General Madigan for giving the public the opportunity to weigh in because I think that element of trust is really important. One of the things that I hope continues to be emphasized is the work for young people. One of the things I'm very passionate about is trying to prevent youth violence and bullying because of my own experiences and my own work within schools to try to reduce violence. And in addition to reducing crime within communities, I want more young people to have opportunities and to have more hope, that they have an entire city that is rooting for them to succeed. And I hope that's something that comes through with this consent decree. Something that has got a lot of attention in this race, and I want to stay away from the back and forth of ads and what is true and not there, but the element of discretion that an attorney general has in pursuing cases, be it cases related to abortion, state employee pay without a specific appropriation, fair share fees, we have seen many instances in which an attorney general may disagree with an executive branch or choose to pursue or not pursue a particular case. Can you please make clear, Ms. Harold, your stance on what way personal discretion and your beliefs as to the law will come into play during attorney, if you were to be elected Illinois' attorney general? As attorney general, I would uphold the law, enforce the law, and follow my obligations to defend the law in accordance with the office of attorney general. That is something that I made clear during my primary, and during my primary, my opponent criticized me for it because he believed that you should use discretion and try to avoid your obligations. I think the commitment you are making to the people of Illinois is that you will follow the law. For example, specifically, if a state law is challenged in court on, its on the merits of its constitutionality, you have an absolute obligation to go to court and to defend its constitu constitutionality. Even if you believe that law is unconstitutional? Absolutely. Because I also believe in the separation of powers. And it is the job of the General Assembly to change the law if that should happen. It is not the job of the Attorney General to usurp that role. Mr. Raul. So we as lawyers uh, often have different uh, personal views as what the language and the plain language of a law uh, means. And as a result, that's why we have litigation. And that's why you have a lawyer on one side reading the same language, arguing that it means something different. 
So your obligation is to, to, to follow the law as you interpret it. Your obligation as an attorney general is also to weigh in. I started out, again, I refer back to my opening comments of, as to how state attorneys general are acting on the national level. And that means uh, Lisa Madigan filing a amicus brief when there's an effort to defund Planned Parenthood. That means weighing in, and uh, that means uh, Attorney General Eric Holder when there's movement throughout the states to legalize medicinal marijuana so people can get away from opioids saying, we're not going to enforce. We're going to use our prosecutorial discretion not to prevent people from getting. I watched my father die from cancer and avoid using opioid-based medication and go through the pain of that uh, because as a physician, he knew how it was addictive. It is the obligation of an attorney general uh, to, to utilize their discretion in the interest of, uh, uh, in the interest of justice. It, along those lines, if Illinois were to legalize marijuana and pass a law doing so despite it of course remaining legal at the federal level that is a case in which we see a conflict of two laws so Ms. Harold which of those would you choose if you are upholding the law as Senator Rollo said sometimes laws are in very direct conflict with one another which law would you choose to defend if the state of Illinois passed a law legalizing marijuana, then it would absolutely be my job as the people's lawyer for the state of Illinois to defend the constitutional authority of Illinois to enact that law. These issues are not discretionary. You have a specific job, you have a specific client, and you have a specific code of ethics that make your obligations as the attorney general very clear. And so it doesn't come down to you choosing which law, it's that your client is the state of Illinois. The general assembly would have spoken, it is your job to defend the constitutional basis for their action. In terms of the Constitution, obviously pensions have gotten a lot of attention in Illinois. What role does the Attorney General have in addressing that pension crisis? And under what latitude is there under Illinois' current Constitution in, for the General Assembly to pass a law that would rein in pension costs that you, as Attorney General, would be comfortable defending? Mr. Raul. Well, I think the Supreme Court um, has uh, appropriately um, interpreted the um, um, pension clause of the Constitution, uh, and uh, we did send up a bill to make clear, uh, to, 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 to make sure that we had direction from the Supreme Court. I participated in that process. We have direction and uh, now it is clear what the posture of, of the court is. And what we, we also did is we did uh, 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 pass legislation to rein in the cost with regards to new, new hires. Our obligation now is to make the actuarial payment on a consistent basis. I, pr I, I participated in a uh, pension modernization task force uh, where we had outside consultants come in and review what was the driving cause be behind the uh, pension liability. And it was a failure under both Republican and Democrat administrations to make the annual payment. Our obligation is to make the annual payment. We and are, Ms. Harold, I'm sorry, I just know we have lots okay. of questions being submitted, so I'm sorry. Let's move on to, Ms. Harold, do you have a response to that question? Yes, uh, two parts. First, I would say that my opponent did vote to allow Governor Blagojevich to skip pension payments, and so I think that has to be noted in response to, to his assertions here. But the job of Attorney General as it relates to pension reform is to provide guidance to the General Assembly about what types of reforms would likely pass, pass constitutional muster and those that would not. Based upon the Illinois Supreme Court's current jurisprudence, there are issues like bargained for consideration, invocation of police powers, those will be the rubrics that they use to decide the constitutionality of any reform that is set forth by the General Assembly. I would not view it as being something where the Attorney General is putting forth their own individual plan. It's the job of the General Assembly to do that, but it's the job of the Attorney General to weigh in with 
w to the extent they seek guidance about the constitutional implications and whether it is likely to pass constitutional muster. In 2016, Illinois Supreme Court made permanent a policy that authorizes news cameras in trial courtrooms. That, however, relies on the chief judge of a judicial circuit applying for approval. And currently, five of Illinois' 24 judicial circuits have not applied for permission. Should it be mandatory for cameras to be permitted to record court proceedings statewide? And I believe this one goes to you first. I think it's a resource issue, and so to the extent there are resources to allow for taping, that's well, something that would be I would media support. This would be media taping. This, oh, this isn't the court taping. Okay, this sorry. is Thank you. Uh, or news media applying, but they are only permitted if the chief judge of a judicial circuit asks first the Supreme Court for permission. I think it's something that should be mandatory, provided that there are no privacy rights that are violated. Sometimes there are sensitive matters involving sexual assault or matters involving minors. And so under those circumstances, I would want the judge to have discretion to be able to say it would not be appropriate or to set up the safeguards to make sure. But part of what makes our legal system work is transparency. And so I believe it should be mandatory. And Senator. I think it has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Obviously, you would never, I would never uh, be in favor of allowing uh, cameras in juvenile court. Um, and those are already in the rules, right. to be clear, but right. yes. But I'm saying just mm -hmm. philosophically, there's a reason why uh, we keep juvenile court pr proceedings uh, private. There may be also s uh, such uh, philosophical reasons in, um, in criminal court proceedings where uh, we want to protect a witness, or, or there may be other sensitive reasons for keeping uh, proceedings pri private, and so you have to evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. But in terms of five counties that don't allow it in any case, is that acceptable? No, I, I, think, I, I, think, we, I think it's valuable to, to have the transparency of uh, camera, cameras in the courtroom so people can uh, evaluate how their justice system is operating. I think it's a double-edged sword, to, to be honest with you, because I think, as we've seen in uh, some televised uh, trials, uh, uh, the trials are conducted uh, a certain manner because of the publicity of the trial rather than conducting it in, in, in accordance with the law and, 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 and the procedures that should take place. Along those lines, there's obviously a wealth of information on the internet these days, but court records, in Illinois anyway, are often the exception. Currently, the Research IL portal allows filed court documents to be accessed only by judges, clerks, and attorneys who are parties to a particular case. Should this be opened to the public, and feel free to, of course, include if you believe there are any records that should not be remotely accessible online. And Senator Raul. Obviously, like I said earlier, the juvenile court records shouldn't be ac uh, accessible online. And, and, and I think there, um, obviously there, there are matters uh, that at the discretion of a judge are, 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 are sealed. Um, and, and to the extent that uh, a judge exercises his discretion to seal matters, then obviously such records shouldn't be accessible um, by, by, by the public. But as a matter of course, should court documents be put online and open to the public? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I do believe more and more documents generally should be uh, accessible to the public and, and, and it would probably uh, reduce the burden, and, and not just court documents, but government documents, that would probably reduce the burden on the public access council. And the office. same question to you. I would want court opinions to be more widely accessible online because oftentimes you can only get certain court opinions if you're part of Westlaw or LexisNexis and those are paid subscriptions. And so I think m putting those documents online in a way that is more accessible ac will actually enhance the ability of pro se litigants to be able to better defend themselves because they oftentimes won't have access to those paid subscriptions. But 
actual pr documents that are filed in the course of proceedings, I wouldn't be in favor right now of those being able to just be available to the public because, for example, bankruptcy proceedings. Oftentimes that involves people's sensitive financial information, and that information, I think, could be used against people in ways that might violate their privacy interests. Also, also, sometimes people file discovery requests with the courts, and oftentimes, sometimes people put information in those documents that don't end up being part of the court's proceedings, or the court reserves judgment on certain things until later date. And so I don't think those documents should be public, publicly accessible. But I think court's judicial opinions should be because it enhances transparency and it actually enables pro se litigants to better represent themselves in court. We, we've touched on this topic, but I want to try to nail down some specifics in terms of Illinois' relationship with the current administration in Washington. And I would like to see if there are any specific federal policies that affect Illinois that you would support or oppose. And Senator Raul. Uh, well, the uh, immigration policies of, of this administration, I, I certainly do not embrace the separating of uh, children from I'm the son of Haitian immigrants, and, and um, you know, our president referred to my parents' uh, home of origin as a shithole, uh, expressed uh, preference for certain immigrants over other immigrants. Um, certainly, uh, immigration policy enforcement under his administration is prejudiced, um, it's racist, um, and I would certainly oppose it as Attorney General. And Ms. Harold. I think on criminal justice reform issues, I don't believe that I support the federal government's position on it, specifically as it relates, for example, to marijuana. I do think that Illinois should be able to legalize marijuana for a variety of issues, and I was not pleased when the federal government rescinded the memo, which was talking about the discretion that U.S. attorneys would have or not have as it relates to pursuing those matters. So on criminal justice reform matters, I believe that Illinois and all states need to be given the discretion to be able to pursue restorative justice measures because those both save taxpayer dollars, they give people rehabilitation opportunities, and I think they are more in line with where we need to go. And I do believe we will be moving to the question and answer portion of the program, so please do pass any questions that you have to decide, and we can put it in this fun candy jar, and I will do my very best to not um, knock over the American flag in the process <laughs> of getting said jar of goodies. Um, while we wait for that to get up here, why don't we go through some specific actions that Lisa Madigan has taken in her role as Illinois Attorney General. For example, she has gotten involved in protesting the U.S. Department of Education as it comes to student loans. Do you support her action there, Erica? I do. I think that there's a consumer protection role for the attorney general to play in making sure that there's proper disclosure for families and students who are making very weighty financial decisions. I think that's a, that's a very important part of the role of consumer protection and watchdog advocate. And Senator Raul. As a parent of two college students who, um, who, whose respective institutions are emptying, emptying my bank account? Absolutely. <laughs> Would you likewise have followed suit um, in relation to Trump Tower and its water emissions and use? Go ahead, Senator. Yeah, I think you know, we have to, as Attorney General, you have to exercise your authority to make sure that we're keep, keeping our assets, our natural assets protected. We need to uh, protect against uh, pollution of our, our water and our air and so you know and uh, that includes uh, I, I most recently visited the western suburbs where residents are concerned about stereogenics emitting uh, cancer causing emissions and so uh, it's not just about Trump to towers about stereogenics too and we, we I, I started to work on legislation to allow individuals like the residents of Willowbrook to have a a voice in the process. And I think we need to continue to work on that policy to make sure that people who are worried about ethylene oxide and other uh, pollutants being emitted into our air, they should have a voice in the process. And Erica? 
Based on the evidence I saw, I think she took the appropriate action with respect to Trump Tower, and I also hope with respect to the uh, the issue in the Willowbrook that she, the matter has now been referred to her, and I believe it's appropriate for her to go to court and seek a court order to cease operations there. All right, and do we have any of those questions? I want to make sure. I know there are plenty, but I've got more as well, so I am happy to ask those. I will, while Mary is walking, um, in the short-term Democratic candidate for governor, J.B. Pritzker, has suggested raising the tax rate overall in the short term as he works for a graduated tax increase, and then boosting exemptions for those with lower income levels. Would that be legal, or would that breach Article 9, Section 3, and its requirement that a tax on or measured by income shall be at a non-graduated rate? And Ms. Harold. I believe it would be unconstitutional. I think we, we have historically utilized exemptions and um, to artificially create um, a, a progressive income tax. I've introduced, I, and I see Senator Don Harmon out there who's been a champion of, uh, of trying to advance a, a progressive income tax. It's high time that the state of Illinois embrace the same tax structure that most states that have an income tax embrace and that the federal government embraces. We should have a progressive income tax and I would absolutely, I absolutely endorse moving towards a progressive income tax. Any parameters in terms of if Illinois were to amend its state constitution in that fashion, how, how that should... <laughs> People have strong feelings about that We finally hit one. upon the thing that people oh, care no. about today. The, the mil, the mil, Amanda, the millionaires are weighing in. <laughs> Do you have any sort of, um, or, or any parameters that it would, that should be, if Illinois were to move to a graduated income tax rate structure, how that amendment should look? How should it be worded? In the past, House Speaker Michael Madigan tried and failed to propose a version of that that would have merely imposed tax, a surcharge, that is, on income over a million dollars. Is that what we should be no, looking I opposed, at? No, I, oppo I oppose that measure. Uh, m my measure would simply lift the mandate of a flat tax and allow for uh, either, it would allow for either. It would allow for a flat tax or it would allow for a graduated tax. It would allow the General Assembly to sit down and evaluate and make a decision on the tax structure as has been done at the federal level and as has been done in most states that have an income tax. It would, the language would simply not mandate a flat tax. And briefly, Ms. Harold, if you have anything to add. Okay. We can move on because we got a whole jar. And I would like to share for those who have been paying attention to the stage and not to their phones, first of all, thank you. <laughs> and secondly, there has been a verdict reached in the Laquan McDonald trial, evidently, but the verdict is going to be read at 1.45 p.m., so we do not yet know, and therefore I will not ask for your reaction to that. Um, first one that I randomly pulled out of this jar is, um, would you attend a same-sex wedding? Yes. So, yes? <laughs> yes. All right. Um, what do you see as an imminent danger or threat if the second accused sexual predator is successfully appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States, and how would you protect Illinois residents against them? So, um, <laughs> go for it. I'm sorry, I will try to weed through. I just saw, but go for it. And um, if you, whoever wants to answer that one. I'll, I, I'll take a stab at it. I don't know how long we have. Um, I, I, I think Roe v. Wade uh, would be at risk, and I've already taken action in voting for HB 40 uh, in uh, inoculating Illinois. As Illinois is an oasis in the Midwest in terms of allowing uh, women to have access to reproductive health care. Uh, I think marriage equality, the, the, uh, to, the, to your previous question, would hang in the balance. It was Justice Kennedy who authored a 5-4 opinion in the Obergefell decision. Obviously, Justice Kennedy is no longer on the court, and he's being replaced by somebody who is very evasive in his response to questions about the Obergefell uh, decision. Uh, I think there's going to be a further assault on workers' rights, uh, so I think that hangs in the balance. Uh, environmental protections. Uh, how long do we have, Amanda? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're going to move on soon, I think. So do you have anything that you would like to add, Ms. Harold? 
One of the things that I would do is make, make sure that we preserve the independence of the Illinois Attorney General's office, so regardless of what happens at the federal level, to make sure that we're protecting Illinois law. One of the things that I would want to do is to try to reform the way in which we do handle issues of sexual harassment here within the state of Illinois. We do need more transparency. We do need the ability of the legislative inspector general to be made permanent. One of the things that was unconscionable to me was that the post of legislative inspector general was left vacant for nearly three years. And that speaks to a lack of concern and care by the fact of by those in the General Assembly to care about that issue. We also need to deal with issues of harassment in the schools. Cyberbullying is something that would be important to me because we, with the changing technology, we need to make sure that our laws and our practices keep up with technology. And uh, along those lines, a very simple question, so yes or no answer. Do you support the nomination of Judge Kavanaugh to the US Supreme Court? No. Yes. And another yes or no. Hey, 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 hey. All right. Do another yes or no question. Do you support same sex marriage? Again, yes or no. Yes. I voted for it. It's the law of the <laughs> land. Yes or no. Yes, it's the law of the land. Where do you stand on decriminalizing certain charges to minimize the number of people in jails and what are your thoughts on cash you bail that I, uh, yes of course where do you stand on decriminalizing certain charges to minimize the number of people in jail and thoughts on cash bail let's just pick one or of those that is a two-pronged question so decriminalizing charges to minimize the number of people in jails Yes, I, I would support, uh, de I've already supported decriminalizing s uh, s uh, small amounts of uh, marijuana. I think we need to look at expansive uh, decriminalization or reduction in sentences uh, from felony sentences to misdemeanor sentences on certain personal use amounts of uh, controlled substances. I believe that we do need sentencing reform and I have been on record as supporting legalizing marijuana because to deal with both the urgency of the opioid epidemic and to be able to deal with the issue of that there are a lot of nonviolent drug offenders that are serving time. I also believe that those changes should have retroactive application because if we want to expand the ability for people to be able to be not penalized for things that we no longer think should bear a criminal penalty, I want to make sure that those improvements are being able to be made possible to people who are currently incarcerated. I have questions that um, one for each of you from the audience. Did so, you want us to talk about cash bail or? Uh, you know, I feel like th th we have so many, we can perhaps come back to that, but that individual got one question, so we'll wait for the, the, the second portion. This one is to you, Senator, and the uh, questioner asks, given how important Mike Madigan is to your election chances or re-election, how can you be independent of him? Well, I was independent of him in a very competitive uh, eight-way primary. Um, I ran. Uh, it was We had an embarrassment of riches. I did not have Mike Madigan's uh, endorsement. I didn't take a dime from Mike Madigan. I haven't taken a dime from Mike Madigan in this uh, general election. So I'll continue being independent as I have been independent. And for Ms. Harold, you spoke to an obligation of the Attorney General to defend the constitutionality of any law the General Assembly has passed because the Attorney General represents the people of Illinois. How do you ensure you are actively balancing and weighing the interests of all citizens when some populations are more marginalized and vulnerable to upholding different laws passed by the General Assembly? It depends on the way in which the issue comes up. So for example, if the state of Illinois is sued, you have an obligation because you are the lawyer for the state of Illinois to represent the state. However, you also have consumer protection laws where you are more specifically empowered and instructed both by state and federal law to be an advocate for consumers. And so in that context, that gives you the ability to look specifically at issues of predatory lending, ways in which senior citizens are being targeted, data privacy, 
data privacy issues. Those consumer protection laws empower you to address issues for all Illinoisans. But if the state of Illinois is sued, you have an ethical responsibility and a legal responsibility to represent the state because this is the job that we are seeking. We do have actually a series of questions on cash bail, so let's move to that. And so we have from the Interfaith Task Force on Criminal Justice, what will you do to advance the end of money bail throughout Illinois? Or do you support the rule that is currently being considered by the Illinois Supreme Court to require cash bail be set with amounts that defendants can afford to pay? And Erica, you may begin. I believe in reform to make sure that judges use two set of cri two criteria for determining cash bond. One is whether some the severity of the crime and the other is flight risk. Because the purpose of those proceedings is to balance public safety with the defendant's constitutional rights. And so I believe it's appropriate for judges to use those criteria. And it's important for them to not set, ba set bail at an amount where someone cannot afford it if they actually don't meet those two criteria. Because then in, under those circumstances, you are in essence criminalizing someone for their economic situation. And one of the things I've seen with the work that I've done in prison ministry and criminal justice reform efforts is that if somebody is unable to pay a relatively minimal bail, they don't have family members who are able to come to, pr to give them that money, then somebody can be incarcerated at a time where they might lose custody of their children to DCFS. They may lose their ability to pursue their education. They may lose the ability to have their job. And then if the charges are later dropped, then you will have effectively disrupted someone's life when they didn't pose a flight risk and the level of crime was not so severe. So I would want judges to take those two criteria into, into consideration. And Kwame. Yeah, I would support the uh, Supreme Court uh, recommendations. L listen, we, we hold people in county jail oftentimes for longer than their sentence, the original, the, the sentence at the end of, of the proceedings, whether they, we often have people plea to crimes they did not commit simply because they cannot bail themselves out of jail. That's unconscionable. That's not in the interest of justice. Uh, we, we certainly have to tie it to affordability, but we, we also need to examine uh, moving away from a, a, a cash bail system um, all, all together. We have to do so cautiously. We, as a member, as a vice chair of the Sentencing Policy Advisory co uh, Council, we've looked heavily into this, and we've looked into uh, various risk assessment tools. We ha it, it, has to, it doesn't necessarily tie to the offense. It's an evaluation of the offender. You can arrest somebody for a nonviolent offense who is a public safety risk. They, they could be a danger to the public. You can, uh, under an accountability theory, you can arrest somebody for a violent offense who wouldn't harm a fly. You have to evaluate the offender. It's not simply looking at the offense. Senator, this one is first poised to you. Would you support Illinois abandoning the interstate cross-check program? Well, I sponsored the legislation, so <laughs> I guess the, <laughs> I passed the legislation. Unfortunately, uh, Governor Rauner vetoed it after uh, about three days after it was revealed that Russian spies hacked into the uh, Illinois Board of Election. Um, he was going to veto it on the same day it was revealed, but he thought that that would be bad, bad PR, apparently. And Ms. Harold. I think for now, Illinois needs to remain in both programs because not all the other states are part of those programs. Not all the other states are part of the, surround, the, the surrounding states are not part of both programs. And the purpose of those programs are to make sure that you're able to know who should be voting within your state. And there's federal law that was passed many years ago that requires states to take rigorous, proactive measures to accomplish that goal. And so obviously those, ha those measures have to be complied with in light of being able to protect people's private information. And so I think we should be lo working with our county officials who run the elections to make sure that people's data and privacy is secure. Another set of questions that are specifically poised to the each of you, and so Senator Raul 
The question is, will you be as aggressive as Lisa Madigan in pursuing relief on behalf of Illinois citizens against ComEd, Exelon, People's Gas, and utilities, particularly given contributions from many of these utilities to your campaign? Yes, yes certainly. My obligation will be to, people, to the people of the state of Illinois, and, and that means to the consumers, not to uh, any corporate entity. Uh, and let me be clear, I've, I've uh, accepted uh, campaign contributions throughout my political career. There's never, ever been a campaign contribution that has dictated how I've acted as a public servant. Has there been a case that Attorney General Madigan has pursued against any of those utilities that you believe she should not have gone after or a case that she should have and did not? I don't know. And Ms. Harold, in light of your comment regarding Lisa Madigan's failure to fully investigate the Quinn era Inspector General report regarding the Illinois Department of Transportation, if elected as Attorney General, will you fully investigate an uh, Inspector General report involving the Rauner administration and CMS that was issued in May of 2018, also I believe regarding hiring? I'm not going to commit to going back to doing any prior investigations of any of the reports because that's not appropriate. I'm, I think it's the job of the Attorney General to go forward and to take any report that comes their way. And if there was a report that came to me regardless of the administration where a legislative inspector general or any inspector general found serious evidence of misconduct, I would absolutely look into doing that investigation. But I won't go back um, into either administration regardless of party uh, retroactively because I don't think that's the appropriate use of the office's resources. The Illinois Attorney General's office is ostensibly one of the state's largest law firms. I believe it would be third. What specific qualifications do you have in management practices to be leading an office of that size? Ms. Harold. Sorry, if you want to finish <laughs> your drink there. Understood. My experience that I would bring particularly would be setting priorities for the office, and it would come from the work that I've done managing complex commercial civil and litigation cases. The job of the attorney general is to decide which cases are able to yield the best return on investments for the people of the state. And so I've been involved in a lot of large-scale litigation where you're working with a variety of resources and legal theories, where you're able to decide which cases are best suited to be able to achieve the results for the people. So I think that's what I would bring in terms of managing the kind of cases that would come in that office. Well, I've practiced for 25 years in a variety of practices. I've prosecuted, which is a prosecutorial function within the Attorney General's office. I've defended workers' compensation claims, which uh, the Attorney General's office uh, deals with workers' compensation claims. I've done employment practices, litigation. Uh, again, the Attorney General's office will do that. Uh, I, I've been a policymaker for 14 years. The Attorney General's office is in, engaged in uh, weighing in on uh, policy making. In addition to that, uh, in the function of my current law firm, uh, I, as a partner, I uh, will supervise associates who are working on cases under me. W working in-house at the City Colleges of Chicago, I, I supervise lawyers working uh, uh, under me, as well as outside counsel working on a wide variety of cases. So I bring to bear uh, my practice history, having tried cases in state court and federal court at the administrative level, having argued uh, cases on appeal uh, to the office of the Attorney General's office. I'll throw in a, a, a quick one here. Who is a Supreme Court justice, federal or Illinois, that you most admire or believe to have the best legal philosophy in practice? Senator Raul. Is this historically or in the uh, Go the for it. Whatever you want. <laughs> well, you know I got to go with Thurgood. <laughs> and both, both, as, both as a justice as well as, uh, as prior to that as a, as a civil rights lawyer. 
And do we have agreement there? Ms. Harold, your favorite. Well, I have to give a shout out then to Justice Rita Garman as a trailblazing woman who has been able to accomplish great things in the legal profession. And she's from central Illinois. And she's someone who is respected by people on both sides of the aisle because she brings both a level of compassion and decency. She brings a level of civility. And she was able to achieve those things at a time in which there were a lot of barriers and glass ceilings in place for women. So I've got to give my shout out to Justice Rita Garman. All right. Uh, we will, um, I think we're, we're nearing the end, but we have a serious question that I would like to get in. And not that that wasn't, but can the Attorney General's office challenge or scrutinize state or municipal governments from selling assets or securitizing long-term income sources when funds so raised are consumed in operating or fail to, oh gosh, or fail to resolve our unfunded pensions. So there we go, one more time. Can the Attorney General's office challenge or scrutinize state or municipal governments from selling assets when those funds are consumed by operations or when they fail to resolve unfunded pensions? It would, determine, it would depend on the context in which it would come up. I don't see independent jurisdiction just to open up a roving investigation. If there was some evidence that was in an inspector general's report that indicated that something improper was happening with public officials, but based on the hypothetical as presented, I'm not seeing a jurisdictional tool that immediately leaps to mind. I'm wondering if this is out of the Harvey situation, perhaps, or I, I'm, I'm not clear. Senator yeah. Raul. I'm not clear either. But, um, <laughs> so I'll, On that I'll we can all <laughs> agree. <laughs> Um, so I think, um, you know, I, I, I think it's, uh, because I'm not clear, I don't know <laughs> how to respond to the question. Let's, let's move on. And I apologize if I was reading that incorrectly. Handwriting is, mine is indecipherable. So no judgment zone. Uh, uh, in Los Angeles, a civilian oversight board sets police department policy. This is democratic policing. Again, this is a question submitted by someone in the audience who believes that that proposed consent decree between the Chicago Police Department and the Attorney General does not create what is actually civilian oversight. Would you try to add that to the proposed consent decree? Why or why not? And Senator Raul. Um, I wouldn't hold up a consent decree uh, for that, let me be clear. I don't believe that the consent decree by itself is the end all. Uh, I don't think that means uh, we stop working on policy to improve uh, law enforcement processes. And so it's incumbent upon uh, the local legislature and uh, uh, municipalities at the local level to look uh, to ways to make sure we have democracy in our system and allow folks to uh, have civilian input uh, to create uh, a faith in law enforcement because otherwise uh, we have a dangerous situation. Public safety is at risk if people, if, if the community does not have uh, confidence in, in law enforcement. So we should encourage uh, uh, the development of a civilian oversight. Uh, I'm not sure that I would hold up uh, a consent decree to, to achieve that. The consent decree will be what the federal judge orders and there will be no discretion for an attorney general to change that consent decree. To the extent there are stakeholders who want to propose additional reforms, that's something that certainly could occur. But one, when, when we take office as attorney general, that consent decree will be in place by the federal judge and there's no discretion to do anything to alter it. Um, what role should Illinois' Attorney General play